was, oh, now we're live. I counted to seven. Okay. Hello, everyone. Technical difficulties already. Um, my name is Dr. Karen McGregor, and I am excited to welcome you to the parent virtual session and welcome you to Northwood and uh, help you hit the ground running in the support role of being a parent of a college student. So I am joined today by Dean Andy Kripe, and um, I, we're, I'm going to give you a quick overview of the uh, presentation, but I want to give Andy Kripe an opportunity to say hello before I start talking. So Andy, say hello. <laughs> Andy says hello. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Okay. All right. So um, next slide for the overview, please. Um, so. In today's presentation, I am going to spend a little bit of time. Uh, so here we go. Welcome to the Parent Path. Uh, so we're going to really help you support your student into this transition. So I'm going to focus. Focus number. There's going to be three focuses in this. The first focus is going to be student su student success, and I'm going to really look at academic success. And I'm going to share a little bit about my um, our philosophy and how we support students at Northwood and how we can support you to support your students at Northwood University. Um, the next focus is going to be health and wellness, and that is going to be led by Andy Kripe, who is the Dean of Student Affairs. And then we're going to have time for your questions. Throughout this presentation, you can type questions into the um, live comments area, which should be um, below the presentation and in, in the, in the, <laughs> see, below the presentation that's happening, you can type a comment into there and we'll make sure that we, um, our moderator will help sure, make sure that we um, are answering all of the questions, um, time permitting. And um, the other thing that I think is important is just kind of an overview of the session is Andy, Dean Kripe and I are gonna kind of share a little bit of stories about ourselves and we're gonna share pieces of ourselves with you as well. We think that that is a powerful way to teach. So that's kind of, and we also feel like it'll be something that will help you understand where we're coming from when we support students and it will also help you feel comfortable interacting with us as individuals as people who are have the best interest for your students at heart so next slide please thank you so here we are we're moving into my session okay so um so i want to take a little bit of time to personally introduce myself explain to you what i'm an expert in and um, build your confidence that I am one of the best people in the world to help your child graduate from college. Um, I know that sounds a little braggy, but I think that if you got to, if you understood that, uh, like you understand where I'm coming from in my like passion point, you'll see that higher education is a very big passion for me. I've worked in higher education for the past 12 years, which is the majority of my professional life after college. I loved college, maybe too much at some times. And, uh, I really found it to be a great environment for me to work in. Um, I've worked in housing and dining, orientation, academic advising, and institutional effectiveness, and now in this uh, student success role where I oversee all of the success programming that is related to academics at Northwood University, which includes academic advising, our Timberwolf Learning Center, which is where we have our tutoring processes, the library, our foundations curriculum, among other workshops and ongoing things to help students be successful on campus. Um, I So where my passion point comes from when it comes to helping students succeed is I work, I, I've worked in higher education, like I said, but when I went to graduate school, I went to Michigan State University and I studied for my dissertation uh, uh, a, a phenomenon or a student population of students who transferred multiple times. And so I did a qualitative study where I spoke with students who were adult learners at the time who had transferred three, four, sometimes up to five times on their path to a bachelor's degree. And this meant, meant that they were spending additional time and money in the college system and they were disrupted frequently. And so one of the things that I noticed, and one of the things that all of the students in my sample, sample had in common is they started their um, programs as traditional undergrad students, and none of them had this plan that they were going to uh, stop out or drop out or move around in the college system. And, and not, none of them started at Northwood either, so that's a, a good thing. But, but they did start somewhere, and it is, was as a traditional college on a traditional college setting. And so 
I think that shows that uh, that there is this mobility today in college students. And so my mission is to prevent that in students. I think that I want your student to graduate and I want them to be able to do so from Northwood um, because the more disruption a student has, the less likely are, they are to realize their degree and they're less likely to realize our mission at Northwood University. And so I believe in that transformative power of the degree and I do everything in my portfolio to make sure that the students will be successful. So like I said before, I oversee the success network in a way, or I oversee some success programming, which is related to the foundations course, self and service, success tools, the faculty and staff. I help, I work with them very closely, support services, the tutoring, the library and the parents. The parents are part of this network. And so if I, I had an, a picture and I put like a star in the middle that says, you are here, you live in the middle of that Northwood success network you are a part of the puzzle that will help students be successful. So next slide, please, thank you. So going to college is a transitional time for your student and you have a, a first year student and going to college and it's a transitional time for you. And so the students need support and I have this theory and thesis and what I work with when I work with people is that your caregivers need support too, so that the people who are supporting the students in the background need support in making this transition. Um, so uh, I, I kind of believe that the role of a parent is also ever evolving. And so there is a very different role of a parent today, and maybe even today in light of our current um, global pandemic and the situation that we are facing um, interpersonally in the world, that that we have a different role and this role is ever evolving. Part of it is generational. And so this is a story that I like to tell is that when I went to college and I went to college about, uh, I went to Eastern Michigan University and it was about 30 minutes from my home in Dearborn, Michigan, I mean, on a good day. And uh, my parents dropped me off and uh, you know they didn't really come back until Thanksgiving. I could have gone home, but I didn't really have a car and I stuck around campus and I called them, but I didn't have a cell phone. so. Uh, uh, so I would have to type in this really long pin number to call my parents and I couldn't remember it. So I didn't really call them that frequently. Uh, the other piece of it that this was generational that way, my parents supported me differently. Um, so, uh, and I don't know what your story was like, but I see that like when, when you have a different experience or you struggled in college or something like that happened to you, you say you want to do better for the next generation. And so you want to either smooth out some of these bumps or make it easier for them because nobody was there supporting you. Or you want to make sure that your student has a good time or all of these different types of things which are in your mind for helping your student um, along the way. I think that's the aspirational point of view. You want to do better than your parents. You want to make sure that your students or your child has a better life than you. And so that's one of the reasons why you see this sort of like concern for students all the time. And I think some of the things that uh, we have are, you know, I see when I see parent involvement and the role of the parent in, in college is some of the, uh, some of the thing, some of the parental involvement and like how parents are involved with students are the sign of the times that we're living in. And so that's why I say maybe today the role is different than it's ever been before. So um, next slide, please. This is my sign of the times that we're living inside. It's my favorite. Um, this is my favorite slide because it kind of like qualifies or shows kind of what we're up against or what's going on in the lives of students and why there's like a different role of the families in higher education. One of them is because there's a disnification of everything. Our customer service models have changed because uh, we need to be responsive and we need to be paying attention to the needs of our, our consumers. And so I think that there's a little bit of a businessification of higher education as well. And that means that we really try to please everyone all the time, which is good in a way. Um, and on the other hand, it kind of means that we kind of are searching for that easy button and students are searching for an easy button and parents are searching for an easy button. And sometimes it's easier to go out and get the information for your student. And sometimes the student just wants me to tell them the information. And I try to help them be seekers of knowledge. And I try to transfer some of that seeking onto the student 
And so I say, you know, I will help you find this information, but I know, and I know where this information lives. And so the, the, it becomes kind of a transition to helping guide the student versus maybe potentially in, before when you would just go for it and do the thing for your student. Um, a good example of this is kind of in from my own life. Um, uh, my, okay, so this is, a, this is another story that I'll kind of give you a little context. Uh, I have a daughter and she is in elementary school. And when she started elementary school, I, you know, I got an email from the district and the district said, uh, you know, when you're, when it comes to your kids' lunches, you just put the money on uh, their account. And so I went on and I just put $300 on because I just didn't want to think about it again. And so kind of that was that set it and forget it easy button situation. And I just didn't want to deal with the hassle. And so I just did that. And so whenever my, my daughter needs food or she forgets her lunch, she can just go to the cafeteria and get it. And she probably will be able to get it until she's in third grade because I put way too much money on because I didn't realize how much like lunch cost at the schools um, or, or basically because she doesn't like the lunch there, then she's just drinking milk. But when I wanted a lunch at school or I wanted milk, my mom gave me a nickel and a, and a quarter and said, don't lose this money or you're not going to have your milk today. And so I had to keep that money in my pocket or I'd lose or I wouldn't be, have an opportunity to have my milk. And so I feel like that's lost a little bit, that independence of the student to remember their milk money or they, or they have seek that like, natural consequence of not having milk because the money's always there. And there's also this natural instinct of the parent, well, let's just make it easy. So that way we don't have to worry about it anymore because not only did I have to remember that money, but my mom had to remember that money. And so that dynamic has changed with the automation of the K-12 system. And the complications of the K-12 system means that we, in the testing and all of the other things and the complications of the process, mean that parents kind of assume the role of the student's champion. And that champion kind of advocates for the student and kind of is kind of is the person who's there making sure everything is going right for the student. But that ends up transitioning in college. The other thing that we have kind of going for us right now is that there's a phase of instant gratification and interruption and uh, like ease of our life right now. So first off, we have like the ease of our life. I don't know how many of you bought something on Amazon today. Today is a day that I have not purchased anything on Amazon, but you know, we have this easy button lifestyle where if you want something, you can order it from Amazon. And as soon as you're able to, um, as soon as you're able to get it, then you, you, don't even, you don't even know it. It's just there at your door two days later. Um, so people want things done very quickly and you know you don't really have to go to the store anymore for it. So there's that customer service model again. And then there's this constant, uh, there's this constant uh, distraction that's going on in the lives of students. And so we're working against in higher education, all the pings, bings, and info that's just being shot at your student every single day, YouTube, Netflix, Instagram, TikTok, all of these things are competing for your students' your attention and become distractions in their lives. And the final thing is that there's just like this, this lifestyle of self-indulgence, this me time uh, that students kind of embark on when they start in college. They, they let loose a little bit and they don't have this structure that's in their life. So they spend more time doing the things that they wish they had time to do in high school, which sometimes means taking a nap during the day. And sometimes that means uh, playing video games for hours on end when like really there's no time for that. And that life of leisure is a little bit inflated. So. These are just kind of the things that we're working against in higher education and we're kind of just kind of and sometimes parents support that and some parents tend parents don't so it's just a kind of thing to be thinking about holistically like how can you help your student make good decisions without kind of just hitting an easy button for them because they need to kind of start seeking some information and working and trying things out for themselves so next slide So um, this, this, this slide really talks about like the cornerstones of student support, but really these are like the things that we focus on when we're working with students at Northwood. We, and one of the things that we encourage you to kind of think about and think through is how can you begin with the end in mind? What's ty what type of transformation do you wanna see in your child as they embark on their education at Northwood? So like, who do you want them to be when they graduate? Who do they want to be when they graduate? And like, how can you help them meet their goals in that way? So how can you help support their, why are you in college? A lot of times I meet students and they don't know why they're here. 
at college. They graduated from high school and they think they've arrived and they think they're done. Like they did the thing that was their goal. They graduated from high school and they got into college and their goals need to, they need to be like a reboot of their goals. They need to be able to see their major as a path to their career and their career as a path to the lifestyle that they want to live. And so I really like to talk to students when I, when they're struggling, it's to figure out, well, why are you here? And a lot of times they don't know. And when you don't know what you're doing, it's very easy to be distracted by all those pings, bings, and fun things on the last slide. Um, so one thing that I encourage students, uh, what, one thing I par encourage parents to do in this is to shine a light on the behavior that you wanna see. And this comes from a, a theoretical and scientific basis of conscientious discipline, which is a parenting uh, process or thing that you think of when you, when you think of parenting. But um, I took a class in it when my daughter was a toddler and it really says shine light on the behavior that you wanna see. And one of the things that I think about is when you start making small talk with your student and they've gone to college, some of the first questions you might go to is, are you having fun? How did you get your room set up the way you want it? Are you, you know, what's your roommate like? And these are really great questions and they're things you really want to know. But like really, there might be better questions that you can ask that will be emphasizing what you want to see from your student. And so and so that might be, um, uh, are you connecting with your faculty? Or are you, are you making friends that you can study with? Or stuff like that where you're ask, asking questions that they can answer and make you sh show you like it, it it signifies to them this is serious and my parents are paying attention to the like the choices i'm making while i'm in college um so i kind of talk about challenge and support so both i challenge you and support you and i challenge your students and support your students in this transition to college um uh I think that it's that the, the, the theory behind this is that you know you're not going to have the growth unless you have the challenge, and you're not going to have you're not going to meet the challenges unless you have some support. Um, and so then we have like I said, I have like this when in doubt, push these elements. Faculty student contact. So ask them if they're going to their faculty's office hours. Time on task. Find out what their life is like. Find out what their day is like, and find out how much time they're allocating to studying. In high school, it might have been one hour a night. In college, it needs to be much, much more, probably upwards of three or four hours a night in order for them to stay on track in their classes. Focus on active learning and, and focus on them being active in the classrooms. They have to be there to be present to win, so to speak. And collaborative learning, going to get help with their learning and being able to collaborate with a tutor is a great way for them to learn. So um, next slide. We're getting to the end of my time. Um, so all of that said, that is kind of how I wanted to introduce our support for parents and just kind of give you some things to think about or some food for thought on your transition and how you're moving into a new role in parenting. Even if you have a student in college someplace else, even if you went to college or didn't go to college, there is something that you can do to help your student be successful. So, um, and so I, I'm going to, the, the other thing is that we're gonna have success tools and we're gonna have tools for you as well. And so will we give your students success tools that help them manage their time or, or work on their help seeking or different things like that that we do through our foundations courses. We also have a, a commitment to you as parents to send you an email each week that contains general information, what's going on in campus, general information of what's going on in their foundations class each week. So basically, the foundations class is a class that sometimes people say, oh, that's an easy class. And it is an easy class, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't go to it because that's the one where we introduce them to the Northwood University culture, resource them with the support that they need to be successful and give them all of those success tools so they can really be, be able to shine in the classroom. Um, we give you, so inside there, we give you what's going on in the foundations class, questions for success, so, so, you, so that I, you can shine the light on the behavior you wanna see and questions for health and well-being. So that's gonna be what, uh, kind of the, the, the other side of this coin when Andy gets into those topics. So one of the other things that you may have heard about, and I can answer more questions about it later, but I wanted to give a brief overview of it here, is what parents have said, how are the classes gonna be different in the fall? And what are you doing? And like some people are going back early and coming back late and all of these different things to make sure that we are doing things right in the face of COVID-19. So one of the things that we learned this last semester is that students don't like it when they have a lot of classes 
um, and then they all get canceled and they have to go home. That they did not like that. They expressed that they did not like that. And of course, I mean, we really didn't have very much recourse on that because we got disrupted during the semester. And so we put our heads together as thinkers and as people who are educators who uh, do look at what's the best practice in higher education. And we decided if there's going to be a disruption like that again, and we are hoping that there aren't any local spikes in that our areas our um our area has been low so that's something we have to worry about and um me and Kripe will talk a little bit more about that but if we do get disrupt is disrupted one of the things that we know is that if students have fewer classes they'll have fewer core shells to go to and if they need to do stuff virtually they'll have if they have fewer classes at one time they'll be able to do better and they'll be able to be more successful because the cognitive load will be lower on them it's easier to focus on three things than it is to focus on four things or five things or six things. And so we've changed some of our general education classes, mainly classes like uh, uh, economics or something like that. That's not one of our major core classes that would be or math or counting that requires a long soak. We changed some of these, these general education classes into eight week classes that will enable students to take fewer classes at one time. And so what they'll so what they'll have is they'll maybe we'll have two classes that will span the 16 weeks and potentially two classes or or two classes in each of the eight week sessions. So they'll end up with the same number of credit hours, but they'll take only four credit four classes at one time. We really try to limit it to around four classes at one time. BBA MBA students will have a different situation because they're having it, they're on an accelerated track. But for the majority of the students. We are looking to create a schedule where they will only be in four classes, four academic classes at one time. Um, uh, throughout the week, like so how we're implementing this is throughout the week, the advising staff has been going in and converting schedules and making sure that the students have the right number of contact hours and will be in the classroom the right number of hours, both in the first eight weeks and the second eight weeks. We anticipate this project being done tomorrow or Yes, tomorrow's Thursday. So we anticipate this project being done Thursday. They were finishing up with it today. I said I heard that they had just a few more students that they were configuring. Once that's done, my advisors want to be able to walk the students through the changes, make any additional changes that are necessary to student schedules, and make sure that the students understand which class to go to at what time. And there's no questions because we don't want people to start the semester um, feeling anxious about where to be and what to be doing in their classes. So um, I am going to be happy to answer more questions about that if there's more questions about the logistics of that. Um, there have been emails sent home to you and to your students that outline this and there's FAQs and there's a lot of information on it that we outlined. So going through it slowly and, and having your student go through it slowly would be a good time for you to shine some light on the behavior you want to see and help them become seekers of information. So if they understand it, that's the most important thing. If you understand it, that's great, and you can help them understand it, but they should take some time and put some effort into understanding it as well. So Dean Kripe, you are going to be up, I believe. Oh, that's, I thought this slide was gone, so that's why I talked about it before. So this was just basically the, the, the email that we're gonna be sending you out and making sure that you're, we're helping you move away from the K-12 style of parent involvement and trans, helping you transition to being a success coach and not a personal shopper and to stay, oh, but we do really, 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 really have an ask that you stay in weekly supportive contact with your son or daughter and that if you need help and support, we really encourage you to reach out to either myself if it's concerning an academic issue or Dean Price, if it's concerning a personal well-being or health and wellness um, thing. A lot of times parents try to reach out to academic advisors and say, I need you to switch this to my son's schedule. And the academic advisors typically uh, tell you that they can't do that or they want to talk to your student or, to, or they refer you to one of us. So the fastest thing to do would be start to talk to me and I can help you understand the process and help think, help you help smooth the way so that you can help your student make the right moves to get in with the right person to help them make the changes in there or whatever you're requesting. So that's sort of the support that we offer through Northwood University. So now I believe this is my last slide and it's time for health and well-being with Dean Andy Kripe. Thanks, Karen. Hey, everybody. Sarah, if you could just leave me up here for a little bit, uh, that would be great before we go to the next slide. Uh, everybody wants to see my big bald head anyway. So 
Um, as Karen said, my name is Andy Kripe and I'm the Dean of Student Affairs here at Northwood University. I've been here for about 24 and a half years uh, and I've had a couple different roles. And to be honest with you, when I first started at Northwood, I never would have imagined I would have been here for 24 and a half years. Uh, but two things have kept me here. Um, I've had other opportunities. I met my wife in Indiana and brought her to Midland, Michigan. So uh, at, at the beginning of us starting our family, we actually had thoughts of going back to Indiana, but Midland and Northwood um, really kept us here. And it's because of the people here at Northwood, number one, um, the people that I've had the opportunity to work with and have mentored me. Um, the Go Mad sign that you see behind me is a really big deal. And because of the students that you're about to send us, um, we have spectacular students here at Northwood University. And it's a pleasure every single day to work with them. Uh, so 24 and a half years, some days it feels like 50 years, but most days it feels like uh, a couple weeks uh, because the students that I have the opportunity to work with have made a difference in my life for sure. So about now, you guys, uh, we're about six weeks out from school. And as I say that, I'm sure that hearts start to beat a little bit faster. But I want to reassure you that even if you've sent uh, an older sibling to school, it's unique for everyone. Nobody goes through this process the same way twice. And as you know, if you have multiple children, every child you have is a little bit different. Um, so I want to reassure you that there is still plenty of time to get questions answered. There are no bad questions. And a better way to say that is every question is a good question. And I encourage you to ask those questions. That's one thing that I think makes Northwood different is if you need to get a hold of me, you can call me anytime. You can email me, cripe at northwood.edu. I'm at your disposal. Dr. McGregor is at your disposal. Um, other people that you will meet when you come for a uh, move-in weekend are absolutely at your disposal at any time. So I wanna stress to you that yes, I know that time starts to seem to creep forward faster and faster and faster and the start of school is upon us, but slow down, take a deep breath and ask a question. Like we tell the students, don't be afraid to ask for help. Uh, that's why we're here. So like I said, I'm here, I've been at Northwood for about 24 and a half years. Uh, and I'd like to tell a couple stories. Karen said we were gonna share a couple stories. And as I segue into our health and well-being talk, um, I have three daughters. Uh, my oldest uh, is gonna be a sophomore at Hope College. My middle daughter is going to be a senior at Midland High School, and my youngest is going to be an eighth grader at uh, Northeast Middle School. And so anybody that knows my daughters, and I know there are some people on this call that do, you are sworn to secrecy because I tell these stories in confidence uh, as a parent from one parent to another. So Lucy, my middle daughter, is a soccer player, and um, she doesn't really know what she wants to do yet with school or where she wants to go. But one of the things that I want to impress upon you, as I've already said, is each one of your kids is a little bit different, as you know, but you as a parent know them better than anybody. And so my story for Lucy, to, to make an example of her, is uh, she's a soccer player. And as we travel to travel, practices and tournaments, we have a lot of car time together. And there's one time where she had a big math test coming up and I knew it was coming up. And so on our way to practice, um, I asked her, I said, you, you wanna take advantage of this time and study a little bit for this math test? And she said, no, I'll, I'll be okay. And I said, all right, Lou, all right. So about a week later, we climbed in the car and we're driving to practice again. And at this point she had had the math test and I said, hey, how'd that math test go? And she looked at me and you know, she kind of moved her head, 98%. And I said, well, good for you. And I said, you know, Lucy, someday there's gonna be a day that will come that you're gonna to have to study. And she did the head thing again. She goes, well, not today. So my advice from that story is it's, that day has arrived and I'm hoping that I'm impressing upon Lucy as well as the courses that Lucy's taking in high school to help her learn how to study. Because regardless of where your student stands coming in to Northwood, 
they're going to have to study a little bit. The other story also involves Lucy. Um, and Lucy, like I said, is a soccer player. So we had a soccer tournament and she came home and she's very, very close with uh, one of her grandmothers. And so after the tournament, and it was a good tournament, I said, hey, why don't you give grandma a call and let her know how things went? She said, okay. So a couple hours later, I check in on her. I said, hey, did you talk to grandma? And she said, I texted her. And I said, Lou, I said, why don't you call her? And she said, well, I texted her. So my advice from that story to you as a parent is your world, your student's world is, is growing, um, but their time is shrinking and it, it's a lot easier to just text. So as a parent, kind of push yourself and keep yourself in that inner circle that gets the phone calls. Lucy loves grandma and she would talk to her for hours, but for some reason she chose to just text her. And a lot of times we just rely on texts. And I would say as a parent, be uh, intrusive about the phone calls. Um, check in with them, as, as Dr. McGregor said, do a weekly check-in. Then do that by phone. Talk to them. You can hear what they're saying. You can hear what they're really saying when they're not really saying it. And a text just doesn't give that to you. And then the last story I have is about my oldest daughter, who, like I said, is going to be a sophomore at uh, Hope College this fall. Uh, so like you all, I'm a little anxious about her returning to college in, in the current environment. But one of the things that she and, and her mother and I have established is that we talked to her on two nights, this past semester anyway, when she had night classes. So she would, she would have two nights a week night classes that were kind of across campus from a residence hall. And so she would get out of class pull out her phone, and during the time that she walked from her class back to her residence hall, she would call us. And it was a great time to talk because she was done for the day. She was walking back at night. This is 10, 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night. So it gave her a little peace of mind. And from our end, it was a great way for us to just catch up twice a week. And it wasn't intrusive, and it gave us a start point and an end point. She got out of class. She called us when she got back to her residence hall. It gave her, without having to come up with an excuse to hey, say, mom and dad, I got to go. She really did. She was back at her residence hall and was ready to insert herself back into her, uh, into her roommate's life and her friend's life. So it gave her a start point and an end point. So look for those opportunities as well with your students. But remember, you know them the best um, and continue to talk to them and, and look for those opportunities to insert yourself. So as I said, uh, my oldest is going back to Hope. And so I wanna spend the next 10 minutes or so just kind of going over what um, it is gonna look like on campus in, in the current times with COVID-19. And I wanna stress before we start going into that, that you're gonna hear me say that students will be expected. Students will be expected. Well, here at Northwood, uh, we have a code of ethics. And if you're not familiar with it, I encourage you to look it up. Two of the things that are part of our code of ethics, our responsibility uh, and respect. And then another one that's very important is empathy. And this is a time um, that we need all three of those things and we need them in abundance. Um, we're asking students and we're gonna expect students to take responsibility for not just themselves, but for those around them. Um, and we expect them to respect each other and to have some empathy. Uh, this is a time where um, not just with COVID, but with a lot of other things that are going on. We need to allow ourselves to open our ears a little more and shut our mouths a little bit more um, and to really learn uh, each about each other and get to know each other. So in the framework of that, um, I'd like to present what we're going to start doing this fall and some of the changes you're going to see around campus. Uh, but again, we're all in this together um, and we will we put these things in place so that we can each of us individually take a part in keeping the larger group healthy and well. So Sarah, if we can advance, that'd be great. So I wanted to start with prior to arrival because that's an important time as well, not just to begin to think about things, but to start to get into the habit of doing some things. So we are gonna ask that students prior to their arrival, whatever their arrival date is, that for 14 days, they start to 
self-monitor their symptoms because you'll see in a little bit that, um, that we're going to expect that once they're back. So if they can get in the habit of doing that and you as parents can lean in a little bit and help them do that on a daily basis, have them set an alarm on their phone, do whatever it is that's going to put a habit and be repetitive and, and a little bit more easy for them to comply with it. Have them do that. Have them actually write down um, their temperature, um, answer some questions about whether they have symptoms. Uh, just to get in the habit of doing that because we're going to ask them to continue to do that once they get here. And then the, the second piece there is a little bit of common sense. Anyone that has been diagnosed with COVID or has been told that they've been in close proximity to someone with COVID, we would ask that you don't return. Um, and in that case, we would you can email uh, Dr. McGregor and or me and we can begin to make accommodations for what the start of the school year would look like. Some PPE we're gonna provide for you and we'll talk about that in a minute. But we would ask and we want you to bring uh, or send with your students a thermometer, extra face coverings, and that can be a, a face mask that's disposable, a bandana, some type of cloth face mask that covers both mouth and nose, and then plenty of hand sanitizer. Please send those items with your student when they come. We can advance, Sarah. The PPE that we are going to provide um, is just a starter kit. Sorry, I jumped to the second point there under PPE. Um, and that's going to be available to all residents um, living on campus when they check in on August 21st. Commuters can also come in and check in during that time, and they'll be provided with a starter kit. And in that PPE starter kit, there'll be extra masks, hand sanitizer, some hand soap, and then uh, we will expect students uh, to wear face, face coverings over mouth and nose at all times. Uh, inside buildings, that means in classes, in computer labs, in the common areas and the public areas of the residence halls. They can take the face masks off when they go into their rooms or apartments. Um, and then when they're outside, we would expect them to wear uh, the face shields or face masks in situations where they can't socially distance. So if they're walking in a group, that means one additional person with them on a sidewalk walking together, they need to have a face mask on. Um, so it might be easier just to tell them, you know what, keep the face mask on just in case you run into people um, because that's what we're gonna be expecting. Then I've already mentioned the second point there that students will be expected to self-monitor symptoms. We're still working on what that exactly will look like. Um, from the data collection side of that, to have 1,200, 1,300 students uh, submitting a symptom check and then aggregating that and looking for students that maybe would ask yes to a question or more importantly, students that aren't complying with it. Um, we're still shopping around for an app that we can have the students put on their phones that would allow them to more easily do this and allow us to easily examine the data to make sure that um, we don't have any issues. So we'll report more on that later. We were told that by the end of June, early July, we should start seeing some apps, um, but they've kind of rolled out a little bit slower. Moving into housing. Uh, most of you probably already, all know, already know, um, back in June, we sent a letter containing some of this information, um, but there's some additional information here. We are going to go to single rooms in Minor and Du Bois Hall. Um, students will be expected to keep their shared bathrooms clean. Um, we will be providing also a starter cleaning set. So when the students arrive to their room, there will be um, some disinfectant cleaners um, some sanitizing wipes, um, some things to clean the toilets and the sinks and things like that already provided. Um, it won't be enough to get through a full semester, but it will allow us to know that students have those things, number one. Number two, they have the right things that they're going to need to correctly sanitize. And number three, we can also put in their instructions on how to use that. So again, as parents, during this time between the, now and the start of school, if you're looking to get a little help around the house, I would encourage you 
to teach your student how to start cleaning the bathroom because everyone on our campus in our housing has uh, the opportunity to share a bathroom with only one other student. And so that cleaning um, duty will fall to those students in the residence halls. But that being said, we are going to increase our health and safety checks uh, to once every other week so that we will have housing staff going in, making sure that students are A, doing okay, because when they're living in singles, um, the, the, the opportunity to, to network and to socialize is going to be a little bit limited. And so we want to get into their rooms and check on them. Their RAs will be very, the resident advisors will be very active in engaging them and trying to involve them into um, campus events that we can hold. Um, but at the same time, we wanna make sure that we're socializing them and engaging them with campus life and with each other as much as possible. So that will be part of these um, health and safety checks. Uh, but then we'll also get our eyes on the, the bathroom facilities, make sure that uh, we don't have any issues there. This is information that's new, um, that we've decided that we're gonna limit the guests in the rooms. Um, so each person can have a guest in the room at, at any given time, uh, but no more than that. Um, and as I said, I, I, we all realize that socializing and engaging, it's gonna be difficult, but we're gonna work through it the best we can. Um, and then we're also going to enforce that there's going to be no overnight guests. As we know, the spread of COVID uh, primarily comes from close contact inside of six feet uh, for greater than 15 to 30 minutes. Um, and so we really want to try to adhere to controlling and mitigating the spread of that. And one way clearly is to try to keep folks separated, uh, but to allow them to be in the same room and, and the room size allows for two people to be in there and still socially distance uh, any more than two in, in the minor Du Bois rooms and you start to get um, students just a little bit too close to each other. Laundry rooms will still be available and there's nothing special that we would ask the students to do in the laundry rooms other than to, um, there'll be hand sanitizer available and uh, disinfecting wipes. So any surface they touch, uh, we would ask that they clean uh, the surface prior to touching it and then after using it as well. And then we have lounges and break rooms in our housing uh, facilities. And some of those based on the size might be just closed just because they're too small or uh, the capacity of those will be limited. And we'll have signs up on those rooms uh, and it will be perfectly clear how many people will be allowed uh, to be in each of those rooms. All right, Sarah, the next slide, please. Uh, moving into dining, we're going to decrease the capacity in all facilities. Uh, basically, we're, it's going to be about 50% of the capacity uh, normally. We're looking into potentially having tents and uh, outside two of our facilities to allow for more capacity. Uh, but again, as, as you're already thinking, probably, well, tents, that'll be great in January. Yeah, we know that it's somewhat temporary and it will get us through September and hopefully into a little bit of October. Um, but for the time being, if we can expand the capacity and allow more people to be dining at once, we think that that's um, the way to go. We're gonna be doing a lot of to-go options. Uh, you won't have to solely do grab and go. Grab and go. Um, students will still be able to dine and, and have all you, uh, all you can eat. Uh, they just won't be serving themselves. Um, we're going to establish one-way traffic flow, social distancing, and lines as you're waiting for your food. And then we're going to move to using disposable uh, biodegradable service pieces and utensils. Uh, a new feature that we'll have this fall also will be the, the mobile ordering app. Um, it's called a Git app. Um, and it's um, through our point of sale software. Um, and it'll allow students uh, when they wake up in the morning, if they want to order a coffee or something for breakfast on their way out, uh, and they can just pop in and pick up, they can order their whatever they want on their phone and pay for it with either their meal plan, uh, flex dollars or uh, with a credit card, um, and then pick that up on their way to class. Um, it also allows for touchless payments 
um, and we don't have to exchange. Students uh, in the past would go to the dining facilities and give their ID cards and we would swipe them. We won't have to do that anymore. The students will have their ID cards and uh, all their meal plan information will be loaded onto the, the app and they'll just be able to put that underneath the scanner and pay however they want to pay for the meal. Classrooms and computer labs, as I've already mentioned with the uh, laundry facilities, we are going to expect the students um, to use available uh, disinfecting wipes and hand sanitizer, which will, will be installed in every single room around campus. And so as students go in to classrooms for class, uh, for individual instruction, or as they go into a computer lab to use a computer lab, we will absolutely expect them to grab uh, a disinfecting wipe and wipe down the area that they're going to be using. Uh, if they're in a computer lab, wipe down the keyboard. Uh, if they use a printer, wipe down the printer. So that way everybody is wiping all surfaces down prior to using it. And then also, as you see there, when, you're, when you're, they're finished, we would like them to do that again. And then each night and throughout the day, we'll be cleaning the rooms um, so that we can turn those over for the next day. But as I said, we, we will really lean on the students um, to take a few minutes uh, and professors are aware of this and we'll give a little extra time for students to get settled into class and then also at the end of class uh, to, to clean up and then also to leave the classroom um, so that students again are a little bit more spread out. Next slide, Sarah, please. So what if this happens? Uh, if a student tests positive for COVID-19, Right now, uh, we have in place a protocol that residential students will be self-isolated because, uh, well, isolation and quarantine are two different things. Isolation is the student is in their individual room uh, by themselves uh, with no contact whatsoever. Uh, a, a quarantine is a student, if they're in an apartment, can venture from their room into their apartment. Um, and um, if they, leave the building, they can go outside, get some fresh air, walk around as long as they're not with anybody else and they're wearing PPE. So quarantine does allow for a little bit more movement. Isolation does not. Isolation means that student uh, needs to stay put in their room and will have no visitors, nor will they leave the room. Um, so residential students living on campus will be self-isolated in our NADA hotel um, as appropriate. And again, as appropriate means anywhere from um, 10 to 14 days based on what health officials and the caregiver for the student are telling us. Compute, commuter students will, will be self-isolated at their off-campus residences. Roommates of students who test positive. So in other words, if, or suite mates in the case of uh, minor Du Bois residents, if a suite mate, so the person that's across the bathroom from your student would test positive for COVID. That student that tested positive, we would assist them moving out of their room into the NADA. We would go into their room and clean it and clean the bathroom and clean the room next to it. And then your student, the student that was a suite mate to the person that tested positive would be quarantined inside their room. If students want to travel home and, and families want to bring their students home, as long as local, state, and federal guidelines allow for that, we will allow for that as well, and we'll make arrangements for that to happen. Uh, immediately of finding a, a, a positive case, uh, a team of Northwood staff will kick into gear support for the students that will include um, making sure that they are interacting with us, reporting symptoms, making sure that their health and safety is taken care of, making sure that they get food on a regular basis. So we'll deliver food to them um, and we'll make sure that uh, we try to make the, the period that they're either isolated or quarantined as comfortable as possible. Um, and I wanna throw this out there right now and, and make it clear to everyone so they understand it, that if, if a student would be found to violate uh, self-isolation or self-quarantine, once the student's uh, healthy and able to travel, we will make arrangements for that student to not be uh, have the privilege of living in Northwood University housing. Um, there are just certain things that um, you, you, some things you get three strikes. This is one thing that we're really only gonna allow one strike. 
if a student violates self-quarantine or self-isolation, this it's just so important for these two conditions to be maintained that uh, a student will lose the privilege of living on campus uh, for the remainder of that semester. So let's move to the last slide in my deck. Sarah, if we could, please. Um, so the move in and welcome weekend. Oh, you added pictures. I haven't seen this. Very nice. Thank you. Um, move in is going to be on Friday, August 21st. Uh, we're going to divide the students, all incoming freshmen, into three groups. Now, before we get questions about that, students that are fall sport athletes um, and they have an alternate move in date, they will already have moved in and your coach uh, will communicate that move in date to you. Um, so these are for students that haven't moved in. Uh, also ESP will be moving in a little bit earlier if you're um, part of that group uh, or if you're a student athlete in a fall sport, you'll likely already be on campus. Um, but for those that don't have to come early for another reason, they will move in on August 21st. And like I said, we'll divide that group into three different groups. Each group will have a two hour time slot. All the time slots will be um, most likely between 11 a.m. and uh, 5 p.m. So they'll, they'll most likely be in early afternoon to mid afternoon all the groups will be, um, and those groups will communicate in the coming weeks. We're still busy placing uh, students into their roommates, uh, into their rooms, and then assigning roommates, or in this case, suite mates, and that communication will come out uh, likely by the end of next week as well. So that way you'll know who you're going to be living with, and you can start connecting with them, um, and you can start making plans for your arrival on August 21st. During that move-in period, we're going to enforce that each student only bring two guests. Uh, again, we have to maintain physical distancing um, and breaking the, the group that's gonna move in on August 21st into three groups will allow us to do that um, if they only bring two guests. So we're gonna, to make sure we're gonna enforce that two guests per student, uh, mask, face coverings must be worn at all times. Uh, and again, we're gonna ask each of you all to take responsibility to maintain social distancing. Um, even with us dividing the groups uh, into three groups and, and maintaining social distancing that way, there's, there's still gonna be times potentially where you're walking through a hallway and, and a large group is there in front of you. And we really wanna to impress upon everyone to give everybody a, enough space um, and to just take your time to move in. Two hours is plenty of time to move a college student into a, um, a residence hall room. So we would ask and put that responsibility on you once you're inside the building. Uh, but parents, you should plan to arrive at your, uh, the start of your two hour time frame. We'll get you checked in. Uh, we'll get you directed to uh, your appropriate room and we'll assist you with moving in. Um, and then once you are done with your move in time, uh, we'll likely have a couple quick meetings in the late afternoon. I always like to have an opportunity to talk with parents uh, when they're here and then a couple other folks. Uh, President McDonald will likely be welcoming you and talking with you as well. Um, but parents can plan on being here for the afternoon of the 21st. Um, if you wanted to spend the night here in Midland, you are welcome to do that, but there won't be any programming for you or any obligations from the university for you on Saturday. So you would be free to, um, to leave on Friday evening. So that wraps up my portion of tonight's presentation. So now we'd like to take your questions. So if we have questions, we're happy to answer those. Um, so please fire away. Dean Price, it looks like we have a lot of questions and we are verbose. We talk too much, which is okay. So I feel like in the interest of time, if people aren't able to stay for all of the questions, 
we can provide a QA that comes out of this from like the most common questions so that we can make sure we can email that back to parents so that we want to be cognizant of your time. The other thing is we can stay on and answer all the questions and you can go back and watch the question portion of the video later if you have another commitment where you want to make sure that you get the information that you need, but that you don't feel like we've taken you hostage beyond the, the hour time frame of this. Um, who knew? We have a lot to share with you. And I think that that really speaks to our care model and how we take care of our students and make sure that we think through everything and get the important information to our families. So question one. I feel like Dean Prep just answered that. There's going to be some content for you the first day on Friday. Um, the, the orientation that your son was scheduled for on a Tuesday, I don't, that's not, that, 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 that particular session has been canceled and we are moving the content of orientation to Welcome Weekend, as Dean Kripe just said. And that information should have gone out in a, in a communication to all students. So there might be a missing loop on some of the email on that. And so that's something where you wanna encourage your student to check their Northwood email. There might be a cache of communications that have been in there from the Dean or from Northwood that has important information in it. Next question. Um, this is a good question. I saw this when I was reading the live comments as Andy was speaking. Um, there should be no changes to the books for an eight week course. What is going to change is the pace of those eight week courses. And so they are gonna have some classes in face to face and there might be some content delivered online, but it's going to be coming at them a little bit faster, which is why we chose to select the classes that were moving into the eight week session and make sure that they weren't those long soak classes, math, accounting, and their major classes so that those ones, we wanted to give them a little bit more time to be exposed to the learning. Hope that helps. And I can take this next one. Uh, freshmen will, in minor and Du Bois, everyone will have their own room. Um, they'll have, a, so the rooms in minor and Du Bois, you have a room, a bathroom, and another room. Um, and so those, we call that a suite. So this year they'll have, this fall, for sure, potentially into the spring, they'll have a suite mate. So you'll have one student in one room, bathroom connecting to another room where there'll be one, one other student. So no, there won't be two in one room and two in another room sharing a bathroom. It's just gonna be one in one. So yes, it's this year, the roommate is a suite mate. So spread out and, and connected by a bathroom. Yes, that yes, was covered. Next question. Uh, yes, I we will provide the Q&A list via email. I think that will be very helpful to make sure that everyone has time to kind of pour through these and make sure that their question was answered. And if not, you know who to ask these questions to interpersonally, it's either Dean Kripe or myself. Um, did, we miss, did we miss one? Do we miss Erica Owens question up there about the room situation? Yeah. So Erica, if you want to contact me, um, my last name, Cripe, C-R-I-P-E at Northwood.edu. Shoot me all the questions you have and I'll get back with you and we can work with you on that. Oh, so go back to the teacher ratio one. So, um, so I think we answered some of these questions during Dean Cripe's talk, but we do have a low student teacher ratio, which is one of the things that we have going for us. I mean, we are very well positioned. We don't have a lot of classes that have very high caps in them as it is. So that makes it very easy for us to make sure that we're just scheduling our classes in rooms that it can accommodate the size of the classes and the size of the sections. So we, we, we will have students wearing the masks in the classroom and we will have them spaced out so they have enough room to learn and to but they'll be in the same they'll be in the same physical location for the majority of the time. So if we're not receiving emails from I think you need to talk to admissions because a lot of the emails that we have going out to families and 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 uh, incoming freshmen are being pushed out through admissions. So it's possible that as your student enrolled in Northwood, they didn't share your email with the admissions team. Um, but you can email myself or Dean Cripe and we can make sure you get on that list. Um, 
my email is Cripe is easier. Cripe at Northwood.edu would be the one to go to because mine has, you know, anyway, go on. Next question. That I think I answered. Um, hopefully I did. Uh, Shante, if you have a question additionally to what I talked about, um, students will be expected obviously to stay once they get here on Friday and then we'll have programming throughout the day on Saturday and Sunday for them. Um, and then they will receive a communication on the time that they should check in on Friday. Before Friday, they'll get an email with the communication that says what time they should check in on Friday. Yeah, but if I said that, thank you. If I said that, <laughs> funny. We'll let you know Friday morning what time you need to be here Friday afternoon. <laughs> Hope you left. Uh, we should have an AM talk show, Andy. Uh, previously, we visited the dining hall and it was set up as a buffet style. How is it configured during the pandemic? Andy, it, it, this one's for you. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to decrease um, the areas of service. Um, and obviously, salad bars and things like that aren't going to be possible anymore. They're going to be, you can still come in and have a salad made for you, but you can't make it yourself. Um, and we're going to have the deli bar, same thing. If you want a deli sandwich, here's what I like on my sandwich, and they'll make it for you. Um, and then as if you're familiar with the dining hall, you come in, you turn to your right. That's one of our, that's the main line. That will still be there, but it will be facing the workers. So uh, employees will, you'll, the students will come through and request what they want on their plate, and it will be served to them. Um, and then they can work their way around. Um, but the students will not be serving themselves. Everything will be served to them. Um, beverage stations, they'll use one cup and throw it away. Uh, again, this is why we're using biodegradable stuff because we know we're going to go through a lot of cups and plates and utensils. Um, but every time somebody empties their plate and they want more, they're going to have to get a new plate before they come back up and it will all be served to them. Beautiful. I believe that this information is provided to them via housing and I don't know when. What's the timing for that? When they that, get their their earmates? Yeah. Um, we will include that in that communication about the, the roommates, the room placements, and then also the check-in time uh, for welcome weekend. So we will we'll have a little what to bring section. Um, and that, also, that might also be included on the admission on your checklist as well in Blackboard. But if not, we'll include that in that communication. One of the things that we're encouraging students to bring if they are capable of doing so is bringing a computer to campus. Um, in the past, people have asked, what type of computer should I, I get for my student? If you haven't purchased one all, already, consider getting your child a PC versus a Mac. I know Macs are so cool and they're really good marketing, but our campus is primarily a PC campus, meaning that our faculty use the PCs and there's a learning curve on the Macs that, I mean, we can help the students with, but they have to save their files as different files. And so I would hate it for a student to fall behind in a class because they're dealing with the learning curve on using their brand new fancy Mac when a PC would have been just as good. Um, so just consider that in the back of your mind if you haven't made that purchase yet. And if you can't make that purchase, if that's something that's just kind of gonna cause undue burden onto your family and that's not part of your financial plan, please let us know that as well. There is a FAQ form for that in an email that went out to your family this week. Click on that, that might be a, a way for you to help get that support needed to get the, the materials needed for Northwood. Um, next question. Simple, yes, we will incorporate that. We'll get them around campus and familiarize them with where they're gonna be and also uh, other resources for them. That so I looked this up well because I saw this during the chat. Okay. So we are a slightly lower, which I guess is good for social distancing. Um, last year's class was um, uh, 280 and we're at 263 right now. So we're just a little bit below it from freshmen. We have um, transfer students as well. So our enrollment is made up of multiple moving parts, but our freshman class is going to be a little bit smaller this year unless we have, a I mean, additional students added. but. We're getting very close to the end, so probably not. I love this. That's great.
Yeah, those high frequency areas have been identified by our physical plant staff and they'll be coming through. I don't know that they have regular intervals set up, but they do have three to four times a day that they're going to be coming through. Doors will be open as much as possible. Yeah, we, we've, we've thought through just every possible way that we can have as little um, touching on surfaces as possible. This, they are not um, coin operated because they are free. Laundry is free. Uh, it looks like Sarah, you answered that as well in the chat. So laundry is free on campus and soap is not provided. So you do have to provide pods, please. We have new machines and, and they prefer the pods. So pods are perfect. So this question, I'll be happy to answer. Um, I have been, one of the things that I oversee as a library and we're looking at collaborative spaces in the library that are also support social distancing. So we want our students to be able to study together and we want our students to be able to collaborate. We believe that that's part of that high impact learning process that I talked about earlier. So someone was paying attention is that collaborative learning is a very high impact practice. So one of the things that we're doing is we're even creating one of the things that we saw in the library before is like people will be huddled around computers. So we're exploring ideas that will allow them to have docking stations that they can have their screen up and displayed out to a few students so they can get around and get a paper or a group project done together. Um, no promises, but like that's the type of solution that we're trying to think of is how can we replicate people huddling around a computer so that they can get their work done? And how can we make sure that there's a space for them to do that where it can be clean and safe and they don't have to have a bunch of students like you know, someplace else where we don't really know how frequently that space is clean or whether what what are or at the end that social distancing and CDC standards are being maintained. And this one we're getting there. Um, not completely yet, um, but we are getting there and working diligently at it. The single rooms we're going to maintain. If you if you visited and saw uh, a room in Minor and Du Bois, there would be uh, either the beds were bunked. They're going to be unbunked, and they're going to be on opposite sides of the room. Um, and then we're not going to remove any of the beds out of there, quite frankly, because we don't have enough storage to put that many beds outside of those rooms. So um, you can buy some pillows, you can buy some extra bedding, and turn one of those beds into a couch if you'd like. It's hard to understand people wearing face masks who may not know the answer. What can be done to overcome this aspect of professors delivering lectures in the classroom? Okay, so this question is about delivering content with the face mask. So there's two things that we are exploring and we're trying to make sure that we're able to have. One is amplification. And so for that would be a microphone or something so that we can um, um, project the sound so that people will be able to hear it. The other is we're exploring the idea of face shields and plexiglass that might be able to um, like mitigate that where you'll be able to see the face. And so we're kind of exploring both of those options. I don't think it's been fully fleshed out and it might be personal preference of the faculty. This is one of the times that you're going to want to talk to your student and say, can you understand the lectures? Are you understanding your faculty? Are you able to clearly learn in this learning environment? Because the students might be intimidated to tell their faculty members that right away. And yet that is the perfect thing for them to have an opportunity to go to their office hours and say, you know, during my, during my class, I sometimes don't understand you because of the face mask, you know, what should I do when that comes up so that we don't have to disrupt to class or something like that. So you can give them an opportunity to show them that's a great opportunity in a very low pressure thing that they can talk to their faculty member about before they're struggling and have to go into their faculty member and say, oh no, I messed up on a quiz or something like that, which is, you know, doesn't happen to everybody. But if it does happen, it's, it'd be better if they've had to, had to talk about something else first, you know, a meet cute before the serious conversation. Yeah, Ellie, unfortunately, you're not going to be able to stay overnight in our housing. Yeah. Not until, not until we lift that restriction. Sorry. It, I don't think this has been publicly announced yet. I gave you guys a little bit of inside baseball on our plan, our plan to uh, put 
students and isolate them in the NADA hotel. Um, we haven't decided fully on how many rooms because if you've been to the facility, you may or may not know that there's two sides of the building and then there's also an additional wing on the back of the building that's separated from the main facility. So we're still working through how many rooms we want to reserve for uh, isolation of students. Um, and if we land at a lower number, then possibly some of the NADA would be open. Um, but at this point, that's uh, we're still discussing that and what that might look like. If we do decide to close it and you have uh, a reservation there for some time in the future, I think the plan is to contact everyone that might have a reservation if we decide to close it uh, and allow you plenty of time to, uh, to find alternate housing. Um, and I think we might even, yeah, that, that's, that's where it stands right now. And then Cheryl, your next question. Um, I don't know that yet. Um, I'm, I'm not a part of the, the discussions on that. Um, so I don't know what that's gonna look like at all. I can't give you any information, sorry. We, that's a great question. That's a great question. And we continue to meet with the health department. Um, in fact, we have a meeting again with them with the Midland County Health Department tomorrow. We're also meeting regularly, uh, meeting once about every three weeks with uh, the MidMichigan Health uh, System, which is the local health system that runs the hospital here in Midland. Um, and testing is, is a subject that we talk about every time. Um, and as we have spikes, like we're having now in, in different areas of the country, we start to hear that testing supplies could be threatened and, uh, and not have enough of them. Um, and so we're sensitive to that as well. Um, right now, the answer to your question would be um, that the protocol will be for those students to call a COVID hotline, which is established through MidMichigan uh, here at our local hospital. All these numbers will be provided to the students and to you all. Um, and once they talk to either the nurse or the physician's assistant on the other end of the line, um, they can determine whether or not they're going to be tested. We as a university right now are not um, at this point looking to do any testing here on campus or to provide that service on our campus. So, but we continue to work with, like I said, the Midland County Health Department and the local hospital health system to see what options might be available for us for your uh, exact question. Um, so again, we're still talking about that. Um, I'd like to say yes, but right now the answer is to be determined. Um, and we're gonna really be uh, somewhat at the, uh, um, at, not at the mercy, I don't wanna say that, but we're gonna have to work with our partners uh, to make sure that uh, we're falling within the protocol that they're comfortable with. So I can answer this question, um, and this is covered in the emails that went out. So your student got an email about the changes of the eight to um, 16 to eight week classes. We talked about a real time online scenario. So if students aren't able to attend class, our goal would be to stream them so that the student could experience the class in real time from wherever they choose. And so if they need to be quarantined or they're needing to secure in place for some reason, this would be an opportunity for the student to uh, get the content in a, an equivalent way to what the students are getting in the classroom. I know that this makes students think like, well, then should I go to class? Like, what's the point? And I think the point is that you want to make those connections with the students. You want to have those high impact moments where you're court connecting with the faculty and you want to be able to interact with your classmates. But we're going to do our best to provide as close to the real deal as possible for students who are unable to be in the classroom. And that just means that when you're able to go, you should go because if you can't go, you're going to wish you went when you could go, you know, that full scenario pulling out. Like I wish I would have when I could have situation. I think students were saying that a little bit last spring, but let's go next. ESP students start on the 5th of August. That's our plan. Yes, Tracy, we, we plan to have those roommates still together as suite mates. Now, if they requested, let me, with a caveat, if they requested multiple, because I know they could request roommates and then also request suite mates. So what 
uh, the default position will be for the roommates to stay together as suite mates and then the suite mates to be next door. Or as close as possible. Yeah. The math placement test will be during welcome weekend. We haven't scheduled them out and sent out uh, the signups or the to, to convert them into when those times are going to be, but there will be time during welcome weekend for students to take the math placement tests. Now, I know this makes people a little bit nervous because classes will be starting right away and they're going to be taking a placement test and, oh, no, their schedule is going to get messed up. Please encourage your student to take the placement test. We will find them an appropriate schedule. We will work with them to put them in their appropriate math class. And they're only going to be going up. They're only going to be improving. And if they improve, then they're going to get into a college level class, which is going to save them some time towards graduation. So do it. So I think this is a bill question and the bills will be going out on Friday. Yeah. Yeah. Changing that, the meal plan is stuff that we will talk about during orientation and they'll do that through the business office and they have up to I think, a week to do that. Think, right? Yeah. If you can get down to the, the business office and again, we'll show you where that is um, when you get here in the, in the first week, um, you can change your meal plan. Um, we, I think we answered that one already, Erica. We'll include that in that communication about roommates and uh, assigned times. Uh, no, no, we, we don't have the ability to store items um, and you don't want us taking responsibility for them um, prior to your arrival. So no, you're gonna have to bring items with you when you come to move in. There won't be a separate one. We'll integrate them into the orientation and welcome weekend activities on August 22nd and 23rd. The coaches are, are great about working with us um, and we sit down with them and block off those times. Uh, so when you get a potentially a complaint about having to miss a practice or maybe two, it's likely because we have them going through orientation activities. However, um, there will be special content for them as student athletes as part of the their integration into the athletics program. Okay, books are located on our bookstores website. Um, we can make sure that we send that. I don't have that email off the top or that. You can Google it on our website, Norfolk University Bookstore. Um, when you go into there, your students should be able to put in there. This is one of those situations where I would make your kid do this put their classes in, put their specific sections in, and it will tell you what book is needed. Then that, then you have your buying options, you have the freedom to shop and do whatever you need to do, but you can do that now. I think that's a, probably a pretty good time to do it. And one of the things that people probably should understand is the different classes don't have different books. So if you move from a section to a section in, in a class, like for example, if you move from like one section to another section, but you're taking econ, the book is going to be the same. We we have a we have a universal book adoption for our same classes, if that makes sense. So there you go, Karen on books, love them. Okay, next, we answered this one. We're almost there. Getting there. Closer every day. I would yes, we're gonna we will have a we'll have a, a sign up time for them specifically on that Friday where they can come and get information. And then they will also get the welcome weekend uh, slash orientation schedule. And we uh, want them, expect them to be a part of that programming on Saturday and Sunday. So absolutely, even if you're not living on campus, plan on being a, a part of what's happening Saturday, Sunday. It's compulsory, you must be there. You, it's important information. So you wanna plan on being there. So this one is one where we are planning on coming back to campus after Christmas. We are planning to have, we are planning to be on campus the whole time. And that's that's our goal is to be there. But if the, if the situation contain, changes and there's a, there's a local or regional spike in COVID cases that would preclude us from doing that or 
or make us concerned that there might be movement if people are, if there's a spike in the area where the majority of our students have gone to for Christmas or Thanksgiving, we, we could make that arrangement. And if we do make that arrangement, everyone's gonna be in much better shape because they're only gonna have four classes versus six classes to deal with in, the, in a situation like this. But that could happen at any time, but we don't want it to obviously cross our fingers, but also that's our plan is to stay. We're not we're we're not making arrangements for that prearranging that like some campuses are. Thank you. We try. <laughs> the I think I hopefully I explained that a little bit earlier. It's two rooms, bathroom in the middle. So your son will have one of those rooms that will then be connected to a bathroom and another person will have another uh, student will have the other room that's connected to that same bathroom. So two students that's in a suite, one person in a room. So that's what we called singles before was one person to a room and yeah. suite. That was part of the single. So basically everyone has got what your son requested now. Is there a corporate Zoom account? We have resources to help students study together. Um, there are multiple resources. I think Zoom is one of them. I don't think we have a corporate Zoom account. That's not one of them. But I know Zoom has made resources available so that people can collaborate in that way. I know a lot of people are using Facebook Rooms and different things. Um, when we use Blue Jeans, and so if, a, if it's a faculty-led study session or tutoring, we use Blue Jeans. So we have that platform. And I don't, I don't know how our licensing works and how many licenses we have and if students are able to use that or not, but that's a good question. And we can, we can look into what specific uh, uh, video conferencing tools that we have available for students. Still two, not gonna remove anything from the rooms. Possible to leave the beds. All the beds are gonna start out, I believe we landed on unbunked. Um, and we can have more conversation about that, but this will be just because of, again, physical distancing on move-in weekend uh, and trying to keep um, staff and students and parents, everybody that's moving in, as well as those that are assisting with the move-in to be spread out as much as possible. I don't think we wanna get into bunking and unbunking on that particular day but if, there, if there's something like that that's possible and we'll have more conversation about it, we'll certainly communicate that. And that's something that we can do um, maybe a week uh, into the school year. But uh, initially the rooms will all be the same. And I believe we landed on unbunked um, and, and we'd like to keep them that way for those reasons I stated, just at least for that first day. Um, and we can work with your student past that. Where'd we go, Sarah? That, I don't know, and we I will write that down as another point of communication. We'll make sure that we communicate that to you. Gosh, I wish I knew this. Is it, is it out of four? If it's three out of... Oh my goodness. That is something that you definitely can ask your admissions rep or your academic advisor. I am just pleading ignorance at this point in time or pleading that my um, that I don't remember. So I'm sorry. I remember a lot of things, but that is not one of them. This is a great question, Dean Kripe. I know a racial tension is high around the country. What is the university doing to mend the racial divide? Well, Karen and I um, are working together along with a number of our colleagues around campus to address that. Um, we will be listening, asking questions, talking with our students first and foremost um, to find out what, if anything, Northwood can do better. We wanna be the best Northwood we can be. Um, and to do that, we need to sit, shut our mouths, open our ears and listen. Along with that, 
we've already started talking about having a task force that would involve students and people from across campus, all departments, faculty, staff, human resources, student employment, physical plant, um, everything that would sit down and have open, honest conversation about this issue and about our campus and about our world. Um, we wanna make a difference. And this is something that we know uh, we all can do better. We all can do better. Um, and that's where we all have to start. Uh, in my opinion, we have to lower uh, our defenses, be empathetic and start to listen a little bit more. And that's exactly what we're going to do. Um, and I, for one, as I'm talking to you about it and Karen knows this, we sit there and we start to get some goosebumps because it, it is, it's what universities are about. It's about healthy discourse and discussion um, and challenging people and getting outside of your comfort zone um, and, and learning. And that's all part of that. So um, I don't know, Karen, if you want to add anything more to that, but we absolutely will be moving forward um, and, and talking about this and engaging all our students um, in, not, I don't want to call it a plan. Um, I want to call it um, in, in creating culture, creating a healthy culture. And I would echo that. I mean, we, we work on this and we, we talk about it. And I mean, I guess working on it and talking about it is important first steps, but I think that we're going to, we're going to have action around it and larger forums for thinking through some of these things, examining our policies and making sure that we have equitable um, outcomes for our students. And I mean, this is a passion point for me. We did a first generation college student study and we looked at both first generation college students and other marginalized groups last year to kind of see what is the experience like for these students so that we can improve the experience for for the for students who might be the most at risk for uh, not feeling quite like they belong at Northwood. But students belong at Northwood and I really hope that they can find their place here and feel like they can connect with somebody who can help them, you know, realize their goals and their educational things and so their educational and personal goals. So uh, more to come and I hope just stay with us and keep asking because we're going to keep working and making it better and just kind of keep examining ourselves and making us the best possible Northwood we can be. Yes, uh, you can do that. We have mail, mail room. You can send stuff to campus. That would be like Amazon, send stuff, care packages. We love that. Um, the students mailing instructions would be in their move-in materials as well. Yeah. Wow, Thanks. we have all the questions. Yay. Karen, last words? Just wow, that was a marathon. I I am so excited that there were so many questions and I think that that really speaks to the fact that this was a good time to have this. I hope that we answered your questions. If you have more questions, I think you know who to shoot them at. I hope that um, we're able to, if there's a high volume, I hope we're able to, if this has generated a higher volume of questions that we hope we're able to get back to you. Dean Kripp and I are very responsive people, but if you don't hear from us, uh, please look for us again and we'll make sure that we're getting to your questions. Another thing is, Sometimes student parents ask me questions and I'm like, oh man, I really wish your student would have asked me this question because when you, and so I'm gonna probably try to coach you back into that challenge and support role where you, I challenge you to challenge your student to get the support they need from me versus you doing it for them. So, um, but I mean that from like the bottom of my heart, like I am being helpful, I, I promise. Um, and if there's just something where you just like time out, I need to just understand something, just call a timeout, call me up and I'm happy to help. Yeah, yeah, and I would echo that as well. And as I said in my opening comments, I know that time um, seems to speed up. Uh, we all have anxiety as we approach the start of a new year. So em embrace it. It's normal. And don't feel like, boy, I'm the only one that doesn't. You're probably not. Every question is a good question. Um, and we're all a little anxious as we go. Um, so please use us as resources. Uh, as Karen said, we absolutely are at your disposal. We'll answer questions and we'll be responsive. 
Um, and I wish you all the, the best as we head into the remaining part of the summer. Um, I, I hope you all stay healthy and well. Um, and I look forward to welcoming you all on August 21st. I uh, look for some additional communication in the next six weeks, specifically about roommate assignments, uh, room assignments, what to bring, um, potentially um, more COVID communication. Um, obviously, we know it's a little bit of a fluid situation, so things might change. So keep your eyes on your emails, keep your communication up with your students. If something uh, is lingering for you, please reach out to us. We're happy to answer it. Uh, and I, I appreciate you taking the time to spend with us. Um, and um, yeah, we're looking forward to welcoming uh, your most precious asset to our campus uh, on August 21st. So thank you for your time.